Welcome to the podcast about investing in startups, where existing investors can learn how to get the best deal possible. And those that have never before invested in startups can learn the keys to success from the venture experts. Your host is Nick Moran, and this is The Full Ratchet. Welcome back for another edition of Investor Stories. On this special segment, the experts describe the most important lesson that they've learned and how that has changed the way they invest. This is the special segment called Lessons Learned. On today's special segment, we have Ben Einstein of Bolt. Ben, can you tell us about a critical lesson that you've learned that's changed the way you invest? Probably the biggest thing is around people. Uh, I am, uh, you know, whether it's a blessing or a curse, I'm a product guy. And I've been, you know, playing with things as long as I can remember and tinkering with lawnmowers and washing machines and all kinds of things when I was a kid. Um, and I see the world through physical objects. That's just how my brain works. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm fairly good at that. I've had to learn a lot of hard lessons around how important people are when it comes to building a company. And it is really astounding what a difference it makes between, you know, a really good, smart person that has an interesting vision and an exceptional person that is executing, you know, all cylinders and has an incredible network and is really dedicated to what they're doing in sort of a different way. It is something that is hard to see in the beginning. And then you get really good at at sort of being able to pick out, oh, man. This person, you know, whatever, they they struggle with presenting what they're doing, but they're incredibly spiky and they have this area that they, you know, can't live without being the best in. Uh, and I find that that sort of dynamic of, of investing both really sort of powerful, but also like really hard for me to learn. Got it. So have you found yourself uh, investing in more of those spiky founders or is it the well-rounded, well-networked storytellers that tend to um, to get the venture capital at the early stages? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, we really do like those spiky founders. They're definitely um, a little bit harder to find. Uh, I, I love telling the story that, uh, you know, I'm sure others have have, have told a story uh, about Chris Saka in the early days of investing in Travis from Uber and the whole, uh, you know, they were going to play Wii Bowling. And I think it was Chris's dad or something, you know, stands up and goes over to play Wii Bowling. And apparently Travis like jumps out of a hot tub and is like, oh my God, you know, I'm the number two, you know, ranked in the world Wii Bowler. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's like random ass thing, but that's what makes a spiky person, right? Like who cares enough to spend all the time to like get good at this random thing that no one really, you know, bothers to think about. But that type of sort of attitude is, I think, uh, highly correlated with success in the venture world. On today's special segment, we have Ben Einstein of Bolt. Ben, can you tell us about a critical lesson that you've learned that's changed the way you invest? Probably the biggest thing is around people. Uh, I am, uh, you know, whether it's a blessing or a curse, I'm a product guy. And I've been, you know, playing with things as long as I can remember and tinkering with lawnmowers and washing machines and all kinds of things when I was a kid. Um, and I see the world through physical objects. That's just how my brain works. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm fairly good at that. I've had to learn a lot of hard lessons around how important people are when it comes to building a company. And it is really astounding what a difference it makes between, you know, a really good, smart person that has an interesting vision and an exceptional person that is executing, you know, all cylinders and has an incredible network and is really dedicated to what they're doing in sort of a different way. It is something that is hard to see in the beginning. And then you get really good at at sort of being able to pick out, oh, man, this person, you know, whatever, they, they struggle with presenting what they're doing, but they're incredibly spiky and they have this area that they, you know, can't live without being the best in. Uh, and I find that that sort of dynamic of, of investing both really sort of powerful, but also like really hard for me to learn. Got it. So have you found yourself uh, investing in more of those spiky founders or is it the well-rounded, well-networked storytellers that tend to, um, to get the venture capital at the early stages? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, we really do like those spiky founders. They're definitely um, a little bit harder to find. Uh, I, I love telling the story that, uh, you know, I'm sure others have have, have told a story uh, about Chris Saka in the early days of investing in Travis from Uber and the whole, uh, you know, they were going to play Wii Bowling. And I think it was Chris's dad or something, you know, stands up and goes over to play Wii Bowling. And apparently Travis like jumps out of a hot tub and is like, oh, my God, you know, I'm the number two, you know, ranked in the world Wii Bowler. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's like random ass thing, but that's what makes a spiky person, right? Like who cares enough to spend all the time to like get good at this random thing that no one really you know, bothers to think about. But that type of sort of attitude is, I think, uh, highly correlated with success in the venture world.
On today's special segment, we have Jordan Knopf of Tusk Ventures. Jordan, can you tell us a story about a critical lesson learned that has changed the way that you invest? Absolutely. So as far as, uh, you know, I used to come in to every uh, investment that I would be looking at, and I would, I would think to myself, what has to happen here for this to be a billion dollar company? What has to happen for me to re- generate a return, a 10x return? What has to happen for this to return the fund? And, you know, always in the back of my mind, this is venture, you know, there's risks associated with this, but kind of most investors really view it as what what needs to happen for me to get my money back is kind of like the, the minimum threshold there. And it's really an astute focus on the expense side of it, of the financial model, not really the revenues, because we all know that those change drastically at startups. But I think that the really interesting lesson learned is being surrounded by these political and regulatory experts that they're able to help me make informed decisions that with opinions that I never had access to before. I used to be making investment decisions sitting around surrounded by people that thought like exactly like me. They thought they thought same approach, looking for the same patterns, the same month over month growth rates, but they never thought about, well, if these if this company could eliminate this regulatory burden, that their margins would go through the roof. And then, you know, so that aspect and introducing the risks associated. So on the revenue side, how, where can I unlock value? And also on the risk side, what needs to happen for this to become obsolete? It's something that really changed the way that I viewed really kind of approach inv- investing in general. So uh, I think that was a, a great lesson learned here at Tusk. And, you know, as far as it goes with a lesson learned about kind of being in a new situation like like at, at Tusk is that you have to remain, have a disciplined approach to investing, but also you need to be nimble. You're at a startup now and kind of same goes to you with your new venture uh, fund. And, you know, it's uh, one that most of us were born out of large financial institutions and you kind of need to think differently once you break off on your own. Yeah. Is your framework and your approach, is it more quantitative? Are you, are you attempting to sort of assess each of these variables and weigh them together? Or is it is it more of kind of a high level qualitative assessment? That's a great question. So it actually, we take a very, so we maintain on the investment side, we maintain a very disciplined approach. But the unique aspect is that we actually take it a step further. And what we'll do, for example, is we have, let's say we're evaluating a company and they have revenue forecasts that are broken out state by state there's assumptions that are being made there, I am going to then go to our regulatory affairs team and I'm going to ask them to help me discount based on the likelihood of success in entering this market. I want to then come up with my own base case scenario. Right. So it's an, I'm not just discounting by 20%, you know, what, what management says. I'm taking an informed view on the revenue side. And then in addition, I want to know on, in particular, on the legal and, you know, kind of the regulatory spend side, is this over or underestimating the lift that it's going to take for these guys to expand into various markets? Do they need to hire lobbyists? Or is this a proactive thing or is this a, is this a reactive, which usually, like I said, is much more expensive. Gotcha. Yeah. In a previous life, I built a new product in the water analytics sector. And we had significant EPA regulatory exposure as well as state level exposure. And when we were going through our exercise at the state level, even though we had developed a method of compound testing in water that was that had equivalency to existing methods as opposed to being, you know, an entirely new method, there were still states that were likely going to resist it despite federal approval and federal equivalency. And that ended up affecting our TAM. You know, our accessible market, we had to adjust down, at least in the the early years, because we knew we would not get traction in certain states. That's uh, the perfect example of whenever we would have loved to have received the phone call. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we could have, we could have worked on that TAM. No, because it's you know it's really interesting to see what some of these uh, you know what Bradley and and the team here are able to do, in, in the sense of um, really looking at the stakeholders that are in each state and seeing you know what what can be done to at the end of the day 
people are trying to do what's in the best interest of the jurisdiction that they're in, but you know, they're motivated by different aspects. Yeah. And having somebody that's got that deep understanding of what motivates the uh, politicians and regulators, you know, for the benefit of the private sector or the startups in general is uh, something that's a pretty influential piece of advice that's uh, highly valuable. That will conclude this installment of Investor Stories. If you're enjoying the program and would like to see it continue, take a moment and leave a five-star review in iTunes. Also, if you'd like updates on new content from TFR, as well as the top 10 VC articles every week, go to fullratchet.net and sign up for the newsletter. Okay, that will wrap things up for today. Until next time, over-prepare, choose carefully, and invest confidently. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.